Okay, and we should be live. Okay, thank you everyone for joining us today. This is gonna be a very special Hot Highlander Summer interview chat. My name is Dana. Uh, and I am Kelly, and we are the host of the Seasonally Booked Up Book Club. Uh, all season long, Dana and I have been reading and discussing uh, the Highlander archetype in romance novels with an incredible and insightful group of readers. And we are thrilled to have two of the authors that we read this season joining us for this Q&A. So please, everyone, give a warm welcome to Nicola Davidson and Ava Lee. Hello. So this season has been really amazing. Um, and thank you to both of you for joining us today. Um, we've had so much fun escaping into all of your books and the rest of the season's books. Kelly and I have been compiling our questions that we can't wait to ask you both. And we have some questions from the group and we'll be taking some questions from the comments later on um, at the end of the hour. Yes. All right, so I think that's on kind of all of our housekeeping. Uh, so let's dive in. Um, so actually, before we get to the Highlanders, uh, you both shared a really exciting announcement yesterday. Uh, can you tell us about the Rake I'd Like to F anthology and what it's like to work with each other? Um, well, we had such a good time. The, the Duke I'd Like to F was the brainchild of Joanna Shoup. Um, she, there it is, the infamous Duke I'd like to F, the, the Delph. Um, and um, we had such a great time working on it that uh, kind of came up sort of naturally that we thought, let's get the band back together yeah. and, uh, and do it again. And we were kind of searching for a theme, right, Nicola? Like, what, who, who, who was it that we wanted to F? <laughs> A great question to ask. Well, I mean, you know, <laughs> we, we pose the, these difficult and soul searching <laughs> questions. So um, I guess, you know, as you can tell, it's it's about, you know, rakes and all of their permutations. And I think what's really exciting about um, this anthology is that um, like, if you thought that the last one is hot, Nicola, this one is right. You, this one's going to be insane. I mean, it's it's uh, it's wall to wall peen, I think. <laughs> I mean, there's your tagline. <laughs> right. We were thinking about what our tagline was going to be. And, you know, I was uh, I was I was I was debating the other day and I was like thinking about like, you know, you paid for one cock, but you're getting nine. <laughs> oh, yeah. That is, you. Excellent. that is excellent. Is it too early to tell us about the stories that you have to give us little teasers? Uh, Nicole, why don't you go first? Um, well, we're not holding back um, this time. I mean, last time with the DILF anthology, uh, they were all, um, you know, MF, um, you know, situations and, and stories. This time um, we've got uh, MM. We've got, um, I'm doing a menage, MMF menage. Uh, Eva's doing a um, MFM menage. So it's going to be all out. It's going to be, uh, if you thought the DILF was hot, this is going to be <laughs> infinitely filthier. So we're ready. Brace yourselves, world. <laughs> <laughs> we love it. Um, and what is the pub date for that? I know it just went up for pre-order. November 30th. November 30th. Yeah. Okay, perfect. All right, well, everyone head out, pre-order that. You're clearly going to want it. Um, all right, so now we're going to shift gears. We're going to talk about our hot Highlanders. Uh, so this is a theme for our read-along that we were really excited about, Dana and myself, because we kind of cut our teeth on Highlander romances when we were starting out. So I'm curious what you both like most about writing and reading romances with Scottish protagonists. Uh, Nicola, do you want to take it first? Okay. Um, I think with Scotland, um, there's... It's a completely different um, vibe from like, your English or American um, or rest of the world uh, historical romance because they've, it's, it's, there's so much history with Scotland and, you know, you've got, it's very raw, very fierce, very untamed. So you've got, you know, the castles, you've got the clan 
wars you've got the you know the the, the tensions with england and you've, you've kind of always got no matter no matter where you are in um scottish history there's always so much going on so i mean it's the perfect fodder for you know forbidden love for en uh, enemies to lovers because just there's just so many dynamics always going on in the country so i mean yeah what's not to love about I mean, scottish romance definitely um for myself i had um fairly recently written a book with an irish hero and um, I was um, like all the things that Nicola was saying, I think there's this sort of rugged quality. There's, you know, I think especially when we think about the, the relationship of Scotland, England, there's this kind of like mm -hmm. raw quality to it. There's this lack of sort of uh, glittering fake facades and things like that, that you might find in an English ballroom or something like that. And, but I had um, my, one of the reasons uh, I have a very, very shallow reason for writing a Scottish <laughs> romance and that was because I had just written, I had written a romance with an Irish hero and I really, and I was like, normally I don't listen to the audiobooks of my own books, but like the, the narrator did, um, uh, the hero with his Irish accent doing dirty talk. And I was like, <laughs> what if, <laughs> What if I had a Scottish hero who talked dirty, and uh, and uh, um, just like a, a lot of American women, I'm a, the sucker for some of these accents. So I was like, all right, that that was like like I'd say like 65 percent of my rationale <laughs> for writing a Scottish hero um, because I wanted I, I definitely wanted to hear that. I love that. Can I ask who the narrator was for that? Um, Zara uh, Zara Hampton Brown. Oh, she's been yes. um, she's been kind of my house narrator for several books. I think since that first one with the Irish hero, which was Dare to Love a Duke, I really liked her narration style, um, especially the way that she would do the heroes. Because sometimes I find that like um, some sometimes the heroes have these very sort of like assertively like kind of like like when the, and I, I and I liked that she kind of soft played it and made them a little yeah. sort of more human I guess I don't know that's just my own bias so um I told my uh, I asked my editor I'm like whenever Zara is available please let's get her so she um she's been doing the last two books for me yeah that's amazing I love the two kind of flips of the the research aspect of Scotland but also the like they sound really great <laughs> as reasons <laughs> for writing Scottish romances. Um, but like this season we've seen like authors doing really different things with, you know, setting in Scotland and having Scottish heroes and heroines in their books. Um, and some of, you know, some authors engage with the history and the relationship with England more so than others. Um, and some, you know, write the Scottish brogues and some don't. So is there anything that really influenced the actual writing of the story um, in terms of setting it in Scotland? Uh, well, my story isn't set in Scotland. Mine's mm -hmm. actually in England. Um, so uh, I, but I, but we will be getting, I know that we have this notion of the road, the road story in Scotland kind of planned for further along mm -hmm. in the discussion. Um, so Nicola, what about you? Um, well, my, um, my great grandparents actually immigrated to New Zealand from Scotland. So, um, oh, wow. you know, so I felt a certain um, heavy responsibility uh, in terms of the historical aspect to be accurate because I'm talking about, you know, the country where my family is from and I'm talking about, you know, places that you know they were or they visited or, or historical events you know that they might have been part of um in terms of things like the um the clan wars or um you know things with royalty or you know visitors or you know the royal pilgrimages around the country things like that so for me um the accurate scottish history was really really important and when I, um, you know, started reading up because I thought, oh, you know, I'd love to do like a medieval era um, book again, just because, mm. you know, it's, it's a different dynamic so much from like Regency or, you know, the later historical eras. And when I came across, you know, when I started learning about, um, you know, James IV in Scotland, I mean, he was such a hugely fascinating character. 
yeah. um, in terms of a king, because I mean, he was an all round star. I mean, he was one of those guys, you know, he was, you know, the expert diplomat, he, was, he spoke seven languages. Um, you know, he was a, he, a warrior who'd won multiple battles. You know, he was a ladies man. He, he had, he was the whole package, but he had such a tragic backstory. Um, you know, with the love of his life, you know, being murdered and, um, you know, having to marry for duty, this, you know, little upstart Tudor from England. And, you know, all that kind of history, it was just like, there's so much here. I can do so yeah. much with that. So for me, yeah, definitely was the history that I got to geek out over. Awesome. Yeah, we all loved King James as a character. I think he was really <laughs> fascinating. Um, so we started the season by reading The Secret by Julie Garwood, and then we'll be following that up later by reading um, Beyond the Highland Mist by Cammie Monning. Um, so as readers, how have you kind of seen Scottish romances and characters evolve through your own reading journeys and as a writer? Well, I know that like um, back in my day when I was, because uh, I started reading romances in the 80s. So um, I think that there was a um, at the time for trad publishing, traditional publishing was doing a much broader range of settings and time periods and things like that. And I remember mm -hmm. reading Scottish romances that were medieval um, mm -hmm. and were Tudor and were set around the time of colored in, you know, like, so I think there was like a bigger, like, it was much more expansive. And I think we've been seeing like with Nicola, I think we've been seeing more sort of um, indie authors taking that up as the lens has been narrowing on what constitutes mm -hmm. historical romance. So it would be great if we could kind of get back to the, the you know, in trad publishing, but and the way that indie has been sort of embracing this really, um, pretty incredible um, expansive history that we haven't been able to see that much of within the past like 15 years, I'd say, or maybe even more. Definitely. I think it's, um, I think it's wonderful, like so wonderful that we're seeing more stories now um, in Scotland that actually embrace, you know, more real life history. I mean, mm -hmm. you're looking at, um, you know, in terms of um, you know sexuality, um, you know you, you, it's more embracing stories that are not necessarily um, you know male female, um, you know lead virgin. I mean it's actually embracing um, you know more dynamics. You know um, like Ava's like you know wonderful book. You know where they don't necessarily get get married. Um, you know you can have a happily ever after. You know without children or um, you know it can be. You know, it doesn't have to be in the castle. It can be, you know, in the wilds of, um, you know, some, uh, you, know, a haunt, you know, haunted castle type thing, or it can be in a ballroom, you know, because Scotland itself, I mean, while it has the fierce, raw reputation, I mean, in terms of history, I mean, they were very much influenced by foreign courts. So, you know, they're speaking French, you know, they're speaking um, Gaelic um, in the Highlands, they're speaking Scots in the Lowlands, but they had the society, you know, they had, um, you know, the glittering, um, you know, the ballrooms as well as the, um, you know, the, the rough and the raw. So it, it really does kind of run the gauntlet from everything. And it's great to see now that we're adding in, you know, um, the real life people um, in terms of, you know, sexual, but you're also like people of color and, you know, the, the people that were there, you know, I mean, there's very much a thing, you know, it used to be in trad publishing that, you know, everyone was white, you know, everyone was straight. And that was kind of, you know, set in stone as being like, you know, that's how it was in, in the United Kingdom. But that's absolutely not true. And I just think it's wonderful nowadays that we're seeing, you know, far more of what um, what the kingdom was actually like. So. Yeah. And yeah. the, one, the other thing that's really fascinating, one thing I find really fascinating is that the, the technological innovations that are coming out of Scotland in terms of like advances in medicine and in the sciences, the developing, like these, you know, if you wanted to have the top notch education in medicine or, you know, in the natural philosophy, I guess you would go to Scotland. So this whole notion of just like, it's just this kind of like, you know, shirtless guys in kilts uh, with no shoes on. It's like, that's like, there's this whole other, 
aspect to Scotland that I think is really super fascinating. And I'd love to see an exploration more of that um, as in addition to the broadening of the inclusion of depictions of different, you know, of all the people who called Scotland their home. Definitely. And I feel like you both kind of explored that like subversion of some readers ideas of uh, what Scotland was like and looked like at the time in your works, which was really exciting for us to read. Um, all right, so this next question is just for Nicola. Um, so in your novellas, there are three protagonists, so they each require their own growth and arc over the course of 200 or so pages. How, as a writer, do you go about balancing the needs of each of those characters and giving them kind of equal weight? Um, I'd love to say that there was some deep and meaningful and, um, you know, like psychological thing, but it's basically for me, um, I have three scenes in a chapter and each character gets a scene. Oh, interesting. And it's basically, you know, the order of the scenes is, you know, whose point of view at the time, you know, is most important or mm -hmm. who has the most to lose or the most to gain in the moment. Like, for example, if you're writing a sex scene and, um, you know, it's someone's, you know, first time, you know, you, you're, you want to see it from, um, you know, that virgin's point of view because, you know, everything is like, oh, this is, you know, amazing. This is new and I'm feeling all these things and da da da, da. So if it's like a new experience, it's great to uh, see it from the point of view of the character, um, you know, who has the most, um, you know, the most to learn or the most to lose or the most to gain. But apart from that, I, I like to have um, each chapter, you know, you're seeing... Um, events and you're seeing I mean it might be the same event but you're seeing it from the three different perspectives yeah. and they're all going to bring their own um, biases and their own thoughts and their own heartbreak or their own you know fears or whatever to that situation so it's fascinating um, you know even as a writer to to see that and to be in the heads yeah. of those three different characters um, yeah for, for each event that they experience. That's awesome. Do you kind of plot each, like, are you a big plotter where you kind of sketch out each character's like personal arc before you start writing? Or are you more of a pantser where you kind of just dive in and see where it takes you? Um, I would say that I'm about 80% pantser and 20% plotter. Um, I do, like, I write little biographies for each character, mm -hmm. like each of the leads um, before I start. So, you know, how old they are, um, you know, what they look like, you know, what their little backstory is, you know, how they've gotten to this point at the start of the book, you know, whether they're married or widow or um, a bachelor or, you know, what their inciting incident is for, you know, the change that they're about to have in their lives. Um, and then for each chapter, like I do like a single line um, outline as to what I would like to see happen in that particular scene. But other than that, it's seat of my pants, off we go. And, and I think that that's the way sometimes that my characters have really shocked me or surprised me yeah. because, you know, they go off in, in directions that I'm like, whoa, where are you guys going? Come back, come back. But, you know, they don't want to come back because they're like, nope, this is the story, um, you know, get on, the, get on the wagon, babe. We're off, right. <laughs> we're going. I love it. Yeah. I love it. Um, Ava, this next question is for you. Um, so our group really loved picking up on all of the 80s movie and music references in your book. Like it was almost a competition in our Discord to see kind of who was picking up on what. Um, and so the group wanted to know, did you have a favorite scene inspired by an 80s reference? Uh, Footloose was a big favorite for us. I personally love the <laughs> Die Hard references. Ah, excellent. It is a Christmas movie, by the way. It, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, Die Hard was definitely one of my favorites. I also... Um, uh, ironically speaking, because I did pack it full of um, 80s uh, films, but ironically, one of my favorites turned out to be an 80s film that I didn't actually see until fairly recently, which was Roadhouse. Um, so I did have, uh, I don't know if you guys caught the Roadhouse reference in that, um, but um, we actually, and like, I swear to you, there were going to be more, uh, there was going to be, there was going to be Rambo. I mean, there was going to be... Actually, it's first blood, not Rambo. Um, so if we want to be technical. Um, so 
it was it's hard to pick because I, I I liked I um, so many of them. And for me, one of the things that I really enjoyed about doing the whole series was sort of taking the inspiration from these 80s films um, and then sort of trying to remedy some of the more problematic elements of them because yeah. they are, I mean, we can still enjoy them and also recognize the fact that they are deeply problematic um, films and pieces and works. And um, so for me, it was kind of a way to kind of um, address some of those uh, concerns, like, you know, the misogyny of the breakfast club or something like that, and sort of create a world where toxic masculinity and stuff wasn't part of the discourse. So for, I liked kind of that, uh, that sort of approach of sort of like, yes, I have this fondness for them, because this is I watched an exceptional amount of cable television because I'm Gen X and as Nicole and I know that meant other, we weren't being supervised. So <laughs> I, watched, I watched a lot of TV, a lot of inappropriate television. And so, um, so these things were very foundational when I was considering my life as a storyteller, as a writer, and then sort of moving beyond that and then sort of like recognizing what they mean to me now. And then how can I move forward with my sort of expanded consciousness as I'm still learning and growing and evolving and listening to um, other voices that may have been sort of cut out of the narrative when I was growing up. I love that. It was really nice to have that in your author's note at the beginning too, because it's something then as we were seeing these references, we were seeing your touch there in yeah. like altering them, making them better, making them nicer. So that was cool to kind of have at the start so we could notice it throughout. Right, thanks. And of course, Bill and Ted, um, <laughs> Just putting what we already so, what we already knew was in there. So many great ones. So many great ones. And kind of jumping off of that, of the way you subverted the kind of '80s references, I think both of you are doing really interesting things with Scottish men and the expectations that readers may have going into books that are featuring them as heroes um, and really showcasing the duality of the Highlander hero. Um, so like when crafting um, your characters, did you decide which elements of the archetype that you really wanted to lean into and others that you weren't really interested in? Um, I think for my, I mean, you know, when people think of the Scottish hero, I mean, most of the time they're kind of thinking, okay, he's either fighting or he's fucking. So, you know, you've got this, um, and I mean, that, that is true to a point, but then it's like, how can you make that broader? How can you make that more interesting? And then it's like, tell us about the fighting, you know, does he enjoy it? Is it something that he excels at? Is it something that he's rubbish at? You know, is it something that he's done his whole life and now he's tired of it? Um, you know, does he want something else for himself, but, you know, um, the expectations of uh, society or his clan or, you know, his family or whatever. I mean, you know, uh, do they want him to do something that he doesn't want to do? And it's the same with, you know, the sex. You know, can he find love? Is he in a position to find love? Or does he have to marry because his castle is crumbling and, you know, he needs, a, you know, an heiress's money? Or, you know, does he have to, you know, like King James, does he have to marry for duty because... Um, you know, his kingdom is broken and he needs the stability of a foreign alliance. So, you know, there's mm -hmm. so many things that, you know, you can incorporate, um, you know, you can take that, you know, fighting or fucking thing, but then you can make it, you know, you can go in any direction you like. And it's, you know, it's so much fun to, um, you know, to turn the, um, you know, the stereotypes on their heads. Um, so you can have someone who loves sex, but is in fact, you um, you know, a submissive, and he can be someone in power, um, but not necessarily, you know, he can be you know, the alpha on the streets and the, the submissive in, in, in the sheets type <laughs> thing. So, yeah, you can just go in so many di different directions. Yeah, it was so refreshing for Lachlan to be a submissive, but also Callum to be more on this, like, nerdy side. He was such a sweet character. <laughs> I loved Callum, and I love the fact with that, that, you know, he was the lead, but, you know, he was the one that, you know, was, was kind of struggling with the, those expectations of, you know, having to marry, you know, when he's got the, all these feelings and, you know, things for Alastair and then Alastair is, you know, someone who has no power whatsoever, mm -hmm. but he's a dom. 
So, you know, you've got all those dynamics going through and, you know, it just makes for, yeah, just a so much more interesting story when, you know, it's not like, you know, the alpha male who's in charge every, everywhere and has got all the power and all the money and, you know, there's not really much that, um, you know, in terms of, um, you know, getting in there and conflict-wise. But it's like when... You know, when they've got internal struggles as to and external struggles, you know, it, that's how your dynamics, that's how you can create these, you know, really interesting, um, you know, conflicts with, um, you know, with your Scottish heroes. Um, I think, well, because my um, initial premise for the whole series was based on the Breakfast Club, so each of the heroes... Um, falls into one of the archetypes, you know, you're the popular one or the rebel or the nerd or um, the, um, now the, the, um, oh God, the eccentric uh, or the weirdo, I guess, or I guess they, in the, in the film, they called it basket case, which is super sensitive. Um, and then uh, the athlete, the jock. And so, McC so McCameron sort of fell into that notion of the, he's the jock he, in, in this instance. Um, and I was really sort of fascinated with this notion of like, and the wounded warrior archetype and sort of leaning into that and sort of making that part of this um, in like the, I generally tend not to write sort of alphas cause I can't do them very well. So um, usually I, I have these sort of like commanding, if they're commanding, then on the inside, they're very soft and gooey and sweet. And um, for me, that was just a really fun um, thing to explore. So we have this sort of Highland warrior, if you will, who's also highly trained because he was fighting, you know, in the like in the Peninsular campaign. So it's not like you're just running around with a broadsword. I mean, <laughs> there was a lot of uh, guerrilla tactics and things like that. But it's just sort of like kind of like leaning into that sort of warrior archetype, but then sort of subverting it because I think Nicole and I mm -hmm. both really enjoy subverting certain kinds of archetypes and expectations um, and showing that they can still be deeply em emotionally satisfying, even if you're not necessarily going to get your alf hole hero, you're going to get something else and can find a way to make that a fully rounded character that um, doesn't have to fit into a specific archetype or paradigm and then expanding beyond that, which I think has sort of been both part of our journey as authors in terms of exploring different ways to be in relationships and what those relationships mean and how they look to the world and, mm -hmm. you know, all of those things. I think those are some things I think it seems like we both, I'm going to speak for you, Nicola. Um, <laughs> uh, it seems like those are things that we're sort of uh, have been exploring for the duration of uh, what I know I have for uh, a lot of the writing that I've been doing. Definitely. 100% true. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Stamp of approval. <laughs> Kelly, are you good to go? Oh, I thought you had it. one next. Sorry. <laughs> I'm like, like getting show. distracted by this <laughs> conversation. <laughs> All right. So, well, speaking of things that you both uh, like doing and exploring, um, you both wrote Widows, which we really like to see as a group. Um, and I think we don't see as many of them in historical romances as like I personally would like to see. Uh, so what was something that you were excited to explore in writing a heroine who was a widow? Um, I think I love writing Widows. Um, because, you know, you can write whatever backstory you want. Like, you know, a widow can have, you know, she can have a tragic backstory. Mm -hmm. You know, she can have a repressed backstory. She can have a happy backstory. I mean, it doesn't have to, you know, it's not limited to one um, trope situation. You know, you can, you can kind of make whatever you want and I've, I've written widows you know who had a horrible first marriage and you know they're like woohoo like let's get it on baby you know <laughs> let's unleash you know my my repressed widow and then I've written other ones who have had um, like Janet in Scandalous Passions you know yeah. she had a happy previous marriage and you know she's still you know very good friends with uh, King James who was her um her lover for a number of years and she's not regretful of any of that. She's not ashamed or, um, you know, she's not sad. She's, you know, she's just wanting, um, 
to find that happiness, you know, that, that kind of permanence that, that she hasn't had. But, you know, she's, she's proud of her sexual history and, you know, that's the thing too um, with widows, you can, you don't have to be the like, oh my goodness, it's a cock, you know, <laughs> oh me oh my, you know, yes. it's, they can, you know, they're into it because they know what to do. And I mean, depending on what kind of marriage they had, I mean, it's, it might be even like, you know, they're into it and, you know, let's, you know, let's have a sex marathon. But, or you might have the ones where, you know, they had a horrid first marriage and they don't know, you know, about, you know, they haven't had that opportunity to explore their own bodies or to know about pleasure or orgasms or whatever. And then you've got this, you know, new love who's going to be like, right, we're going to teach you everything. So, right. you know, widows, oh, I just think that, you know, widows are so fascinating and you can do so much with, with the story. Definitely. I feel like Janet and Beatrice would be very good friends, actually. <laughs> like, I feel like Janet would take her hand and be like, let me show you the world. I have so much to <laughs> teach you. That sounds oh, like a, from, from Aladdin. You know, <laughs> let me show you your clitoris. <laughs> And not um, once, many times. Yeah. <laughs> just, keep, just keep knocking, keep knocking on that door because somebody's going to answer. Right. Um, well, you know, I I have always struggled writing virgin heroines because of that very reason that like for some of these like uh, ownership of sexuality and their body and things like that. And I also um, sort of push back against this notion that like, I know that there are, um, there, there was a certain amount of, um, um, sort of throttle on like what women and young women were taught about their bodies. But I'm also like, and they also took baths. I mean, they kind of, you know, they had access to their bodies and stuff like that. So it's like, um, I, I'm, I'm always a little reluctant when there's this, like the hero knows everything about the heroine's body. If we're talking MF um, and the heroine doesn't know anything um, that always sort of like, uh, kind of rub me the wrong way as it were yeah. or not um and so I, I i would subvert that by i created a, a an author of um, erotic romances and all of my virgin heroines happen to read these erotic romances yes. but um uh, for widow heroines i really um generally speaking they're on the older side they're generally you know they're probably over 30 and i'm definitely over 30 and so i kind of also wanted to explore this notion that like love and romance and adventure and things like that they don't they're not limited to this kind of narrow window um when society tells a woman that she's valuable um so i kind of wanted to explore what it was like to sort of take ownership of yourself and and i have written widows who have had happy marriages and unhappy marriages and they're ready to kind of like embrace this component of their life so um one of the reasons I really like it is because I'm generally not a big fan of writing virgin heroines. So yeah. this is kind of a way that I can have an older heroine or a heroine who has more experience, sexual experience so that when she, she isn't like, what is that cock? I don't understand. <laughs> if I, can hit you, I, you know, like, I kind of wanted them to have a little <laughs> sort of foundational knowledge. Um, sorry. Um, about, about that sort of thing. So, um, and then, you know, with like Duncan and Beatrice, there's this whole world, as it were, yeah. of um, Dom and sort of submissive kind of relationship that they can both explore together because he's not really that familiar with being a dominant either. So they both kind yeah. of learn about this, about themselves. And I like this notion that this journey that we're on in life doesn't end at 30 or 35 or 40 or beyond, you know, yeah. um, and um, I have gray streaks in my hair too. And I'm like, I'm just as viable as anybody else. I. I hope. Right. Yeah, I, I love, that. I love <laughs> that for both of you, like the widow characters, I feel like so many times with historical romance, it's like the book starts, this is like the first time the female character has ever lived. And, you know, the hero or the love interest with the na naive kind of character has lived this whole life before them. And now they're experiencing, and it's like, that's not true. People live lives before they first have their first like real romance or their lasting romance. And it gives you a notion like you have a comparison, you know what I mean? Because it's like, how do you know what's good and what isn't if you, if this is the only thing you've ever experienced in your, yeah. in your whole life? Yeah, I agree. Um, 
So, I mean, on this topic uh, that we've ended up in terms of talking about sexuality and, oh, I was going to skip to a different question. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry, sorry, Dana, I'm throwing you off. Um, but just in talking about like the dom and sub relationship that we end up seeing in both of your work, uh, there is kind of this exploration of like control and dominance during intimacy. Um, and Nicola, you touched on this a little bit earlier, talking about how the societal uh, power at the time also kind of plays into how you write those characters. So I'd love to hear more about how you kind of balance like who has the societal power, who has like the power in the bedroom, but also how I think bedroom power is often really shared. Um, like I, we were talking um, before we went live about blowjobs as you do. And I know one thing I love as a reader is that moment where the person giving the blowjob feel, knows they're like, I am the one in power here, you know? Um, I think it's, I think it's a the most fascinating dynamic in terms of um, that I find. You know, when I'm writing, is where you've got someone who is, you know, the dom in the street. You know, or that there's someone with mm -hmm. a lot of power. You know, whether it's because of their position or their their job or you know their family or um, whatever. You know, whether they're the duke or the earl or the you know the king or whatever. And then there's someone who you know, that's all they want. They don't actually want, you know, they've been put into this position. It might be a birthright. It might be, you know, because they're the eldest son or because they're, you know, the man or whatever. And they've got this, um, you know, this position or this power that might not necessarily be something that they want. And then, you know, you've got these, um, you know, the men, for example, you know, they are the warrior, they are the... Um, the title holder or whatever, but they, they just want to be told what to do. They just want, you know, someone to come in and to give them commands and, you know, it might be that they, you know, they'd like, you know, their, their lady love to, um, or their man love to, you know, give them a nice good whipping. And it's, it's that whole dynamic of you know, power and how you approach power. And, mm -hmm. you know, it can be, it's a very nice balance to have it, you know, when you are the alpha in the streets and the submissive in the, in the, in the sheets. And but I find it even even more interesting to write when um, when it's a femdom, mm -hmm. and you've got the woman who might not in society. I mean, she might have very little power, especially if she's a married woman, because basically, you know, back in the day, you know, married women had very little power. They actually had far more as a widow or as a single woman. So. You know, for all the people who were like, oh, no, everyone wanted to get married. And it's like, well, actually, they didn't because they knew, you know, once that ring was on their finger, you know, that was kind of it. They, they kind of had to, um, you know, submit to um, society or the law or the church. Um, and and that was kind of it. So, you know, when you get these women who can suddenly, you know, into the bedroom and it's like, you know, they're, they're in charge. It's just this amazing dynamic. And, you know, it's so interesting, um, you know, where they can finally, you know, be the, you know, the dominant that they are, be the feisty firepower that they are, because, you know, they're in that place where they feel like they should be, but they can't because these outside influences or these outside things are stopping them from, you know, realising, you know, where they want to be in the world. So, you know, when you can actually you know, write a character who gets to find a place in the world where they can be who they really are, you know, that's where you've got a really great romance. Yes, agreed. Um, the book before this one in the Union of the Rake series was Femdom. So, um, and that was the, the, in that situation that it was the Duke who was the Duke in the streets and the sub in the sheets. Um, and I did like to explore, like Nicole was talking about, that sort of dynamic between like, you know, somebody who's become powerful, they inherit this power, mm -hmm. um, and they might not necessarily want it, or it comes, like there's there's um, certain um, costs that come with that, and so sort of the surrendering of that um, to somebody that you trust, and I think that the notion of the submissive and dominance and submissive, submissive is uh, predicated a lot on that kind of trust and valuation between the two uh, or three or however many people are involved in this kind of in this scenario, but they're all like you. The whole 
the, I, I guess sometimes when people were talking um, negatively about Fifty Shades is because there was not this trust um, and there was manipulation and things like that that really don't have a place in a healthy BDSM kind of a relationship. Mm -hmm. um, so, and I, I wanted to explore um, just what that meant, you know, that notion in, in where Beatrice sort of like, she wants to live her life, but also she has this sort of strong guiding um, person beside her who can kind of let her surrender to her pleasure and he's there to catch her and you know provide the aftercare and 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 but not abuse the situation so i think for me that was one of the things that i definitely wanted to explore and i wanted to hear somebody talk dirty talk dominant dirty talk in the yes. Scottish accent i mean <laughs> All you know, ones. i'm not proud <laughs> I mean, you should be because the dirty talk was A plus. So awesome! Mission accomplished. All the yes. fancy graduate degrees <laughs> paying off. Um, I will take the next question. So um, you kind of mentioned this earlier, Ava. Um, so the road trip aspect. I think we, after reading the, the secret and waiting for a Scott like you, we've come to realize that it's kind of a thing for these Scottish romances. And like when we were also looking up other books that we wanted to read this season. So why do you think the Highland road trip romance works so well? Um, I think that there's this sort of inherent notion of place that's really important in Highland romance, in, in uh, specifically Highland romance, but just in Scotland in general, because it's like there's something about the Scottish uh, a landscape, I think, that is part of the mystique and um, sort of in getting yourself into that landscape, where as opposed to just sort of being like stationary in a particular place. I think that kind of is part of that. It's not all of it. Um, and then there's like the resourcefulness that we sort of associate with um, that fearlessness, the boldness, because on a road trip, you're going to encounter things. I mean, that's kind of the, that's the whole point is like it's episodic to an extent and it builds because you're like, OK, now what? And now what? And so we get to see um, people thinking on their feet. We get to see people being competent porn. We get to see some pretty outrageous scenarios that you also get to survive, which is pretty awesome mm -hmm. because we don't necessarily have that guarantee in life. So I think all those, <clears throat> excuse me, all those elements combine. And I think when you package it up with that sort of notion of that rugged, um, um, co competent Scottish character, it all becomes, and toughness, I think, that sort of like not necessarily, they might be sad on the, or, or scared on the inside, but outside it's like, we're gonna get this done. Yes. I think you can, I think with a Scottish road trip, and I know that one of the things I enjoyed when I was writing Scandalous Passions, when they, they have the road trip from Stirling Castle to St Andrews, I mean, you're, through that whole time, you're seeing so many different parts of Scotland. You're seeing, you know, the Royal Castle. You're seeing, you know, the um, kind of the unkempt, you know, you know, sort of backward, you know, backwater roads where, you know, it's treacherous and, you know, you can be attacked from, you know, up from anywhere, you know, from, you know, the brigands hiding in the, in the, you know, in the, in the shrubbery type thing. And you see, you know, the crofter's cottage, you know, you, you're going through different, you know, clan lands, you know, so you've always got that danger. You've got that um, that aspect of, um, and, and, and you're going through history because, I mean, you know, Stirling Castle is so ancient and, I mean, it's been standing, you know, you know, since before medieval times and it swapped hands between, you know, the Scots and the English like several times as well. And it's kind of known as like, you know, the brooch that fastens the highlands and the lowlands. So you've got, you know, these amazing places. And I mean, you can take it in any direction you want. You can talk about the modern aspects or you can talk about, you know, the architecture. You can talk about, um, you know, the, you know, the, the modern things that for the, for the era or, you know, and then you're carrying on and you're going to places, you know, that might be newer. Um, and then you're carrying on to somewhere like St Andrews, which is also, you know, an extremely ancient place in the scheme of things. I mean, St Andrews University is, you know, one of the oldest universities in the entire world. Um, and, you know, they got their papal bull, I think it's somewhere in the uh, 1300s. 
So, um, and, and St Andrews was a place in Scotland where, you know, people went on pilgrimages to because it was considered a very holy, holy place. Um, you know, they had the cathedral there and they had relics, um, you know, like historic, uh, you know, ancient um, Christian relics. So people used to go from all over um, the world to go to St Andrews, you know, for their pilgrimage um, so they could touch, you know, the, the bones or the blood or, the, or whatever. Um, and it's just that kind of thing, like Scotland, no matter where you're going, no matter where you are, I mean, you know, you can write any kind of book because on that road trip, you're going to see so many different aspects of the world. And no matter what you're thinking of, whether it's the castle or the crofter's cottage or the, you know, the ancient university or the, you know, the wide, you know, barren lands, you know, of a, of a clan that's struggling or, you know, the, you know, the very well, um, looked after lands of a clan that's um you know that's going ahead it's it's yeah you can it's there scotland scotland's there for you awesome all right should we uh, move into our games since it's getting a late yes awesome so, all right dana i'll let you a little highland tourney for you this is dedicated to you nicola <laughs> um <laughs> Which game set would you like to start with, Kelly? Um, let's let's start with running. Okay. I'll so let... this is based on the tourney from Wicked Passions, which had each of its different aspects. So first for running, this is our speed round, this or that. Very quickly, as I bring them up on screen, pick your favorite. Okay. Do we, uh, is this for both of us or for Nicola? Because I'm both of you. for everyone. Okay, everybody. Yes. Right. Yeah. Okay. Even you all in the audience, type in your answers. <laughs> all right. Highlands or lowlands? Highlands. Oh, yeah, highlands. Highlands. Okay. Friends to lovers or enemies to lovers? Enemies to lovers. I like friends to lovers, but I'm kind of weird. <laughs> Definitely an enemy <laughs> person. All answers accepted here. <laughs> okay. Broadsword or bow and arrow? Ooh. Broadsword. Yeah, I'm probably going to go with broadsword on that one. Okay. It's the badass one. Starchy hero or cinnamon roll? Cinnamon roll. Starchy. <laughs> hey, trapped in the footloose town or trapped in the tension? <laughs> <laughs> oh man, they're both buzz kills. <laughs> I'd say trapped in Footloose Town. I'd, I'd probably say trapped in Footloose Town as well. Yeah. <laughs> learn to sword fight or learn to make a Bedford Bedfordshire <laughs> clinger. <laughs> I think I'd have a higher success rate with a Bedfordshire clanger. <laughs> Same. I'd learn to sword fight. <laughs> Okay. Kelly, are awesome. you ready for archery? I'm, I'm ready. <laughs> All right, so archery is our second game. Uh, this is a test your Scottish knowledge. Um, so this is going to be a head-to-head, -head, whoever answers first gets a point. Like no, whose line, the bad. points don't matter. <laughs> So, um, also, you right, so. don't know because Kelly likes very difficult trivia. So, like, I didn't know half of these things anyway. So, I think based on the history that you have both dropped in this conversation already, I feel like I made it too easy, but we'll see. Um, all right. So, Diana Gabaldon's Outlander was originally published under a different title. What was that title? I do not know. Ooh, I, 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 I have no idea. We are starting with the tough one then. It was cross stitch. Oh. They just okay. <laughs> decided okay. that was not kind of like stitching time. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. They clearly decided that didn't work and switched it to Outlander, which is what we all know and love. Yeah, um, cross stitch okay. the series might not be quite the. Um, not, no, not, <laughs> not as engaging. Yeah. <laughs> not as engaging. Um, all right. So in Waiting for a Scott Like You, Duncan is a former right. member of the 79th Regiment of Foot, also known as? The Kings Cameron Highlanders. Not Kings. Queens? 
Yes. <laughs> Somebody's <laughs> Somebody the camera. Silent. Silent. <laughs> it's close. Yes. You know, I write. A, I've written a few books between now and then. So <laughs> I, my my retention for the facts that I learn while I'm working on these books is not awesome. I mean, you were like ninety percent. <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right. So in uh, 1503, King James IV married this royal to link Scotland and England together. Who was she? Margaret Tudor. Yes. Ding, ding, ding. <laughs> I didn't even bother with that one. Right. <laughs> Nicola was ready. Yeah. Uh, which, <laughs> which Scottish title was given to Prince William and Kate Middleton once they married? Should I bring the answer up? I mean, I, oh, oh no. I was going to say it like the Lord Jerkface. Layer jerk face. <laughs> More accurate. <laughs> Sorry. Weirdly, not, not Lord no? Jerkface. Um, okay. It's the Earl and Countess of Strathern. Um, all right. This last one requires some pronunciation on my part. Um, the Gaelic for whiskey is Ugaba. Uh, what does that translate to? Something to sit you on your ass? Yeah. <laughs> it translates water to water of life. <laughs> it's whiskey in Scotland. It has to be water of life. All right, that, that is our, our archery round. Okay, so next up is Rock Throw. And so this is our fun game title smash that we've done for several different interviews. So we've combined your titles and we would love like a one or two sentences of like, what do you think this new title book would be? Rapid fire. <laughs> so waiting for a scandalous passion. Uh, let's, I will give it to whoever, whoever has the first idea. This is like, I'm, the, I'm so bad at plotting. <laughs> this is why I have to like sit and think. Maybe. Um, I think it's a repressed widow. Okay. I'll be yeah. for it. I'll, I'll buy then, that. You know, and then there's like a new, new guy who moves next door and uh, he's very grumpy. I've decided he's very grumpy. I Yes, and I've always loved it from a scandalous passion. <laughs> <laughs> they need to meet each other. It needs to start. They do. <laughs> Maybe there's a crofter's cottage that they both get um, Scott. They mm -hmm. get caught in, and and at some point. Yes, Ooh, perfect. <laughs> then our second title is "Wicked for a Scot Like You." Mm. So bad at this. Is this my job? <laughs> I mean, we are putting you on the spot. I feel like this is another BDSM story. <laughs> yeah, I definitely think these can convolve. <laughs> definitely. I think there has to be. Okay. I think we should move on to probably the most fun round, which is sword fighting. And it's also our last round. And it's Fuck, Mary kill, the greatest game ever to be. And I've also prepared a PowerPoint, <laughs> as one does. So let me- We wanted you to be able to three. see your options. Okay. Uh, they are all Scottish, famous Scots uh, to choose from. Excellent. Oh my God, can anyone see it? There we go. Yes, We're yes, good. I need to see the Fuck, Mary away. Kill screen. Okay, so round one, we have the lovely James McAvoy, David Tennant, and Ro Rose Leslie. <laughs> Who would you fuck, Mary or kill? This is a very hard round. This is, I know, you started tough. Especially with this picture of James McAvoy. Well, I mean, like, I was like, it. McAvoy, Mr. McAvoy was um, a major inspiration for McCameron. And then, um, especially because of the Bedfordshire Clanger scene, I was like, when the, the GBBO promo of his, this episode was coming up, I like shamelessly exploited it because I was just like, <laughs> look at those forearms and those biceps while he's, yes. you know, talking about how sticky his dough is. So, uh, <laughs> Um, 
I think, yeah, go for it. Yes. Um, I would say fuck McAvoy, Mary Rose, and then mm -hmm. kill Tenant. Sorry. Poor Tenant. <clears throat> I know, I know. That's my bias. I preferred, um, I think, was it the 11th Doctor? Matt Smith. Oh, Matt Smith. No, oh, God, no, not Matt Smith. Um, Eccleson? Yes, I know Eccleson. I'm weird, but I really, I really. No, I, love, I do uh, love Eccleson. Yeah, so he was, he's been my favorite of the newest iterations of the Doctor. Understandable. I think that I would, I would marry, <clears throat> I would marry James uh, fuck Rose and uh, sorry, David. I'm afraid you're dying <laughs> twice. <laughs> he is not making out well in this. I mean, well, but he'll just regenerate, right? That, that, okay, I like that. Yes, yes, he just regenerates. He's fine. <laughs> Maybe this time he'll be a redhead. Right. <laughs> the dream. That is also my answer. So I don't know if Kelly, you defer. Yeah. I I feel really bad for David, but yeah, I think that that may be where I go as well. <laughs> Okay, so round two, we have very steaminess. We have Sam Hewen, mm. this is Karen Gillan, another Doctor Who star, and then we have Ewan McGregor. Look at us right in the eyes. <laughs> um, I would fuck Ewan, marry um, Karen, and I guess by process of elimination. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, but uh, yeah, that's where I'm. But I mean, like you're kind of you're not playing fair, here, are you? <laughs> no, no. this not is a all. tough, <laughs> tough round. With I have like these blue eyes staring at me, these abs staring at me. <laughs> like I had to pick like persuasive photos, you know. I'm fair, fair. I think for this particular round, I think I'd um, I'd fuck Sam, marry Ewan, and unfortunately, by sheer process of elimination, that um, the lovely lady in the middle unfortunately has to die. But she'll come back. It's fine. Yeah. Has well, it is with Jumanji. She's just she will actually come back, so it's fine. Oh. So yeah, there we go. That works perfectly for us. <laughs> um, I think I would. Marry Ewan, fuck Karen, and then kill Sam. I feel like just like seeing Sam on the internet, he seems very into himself. So I'm like, oh. I, I want you to be into me. So bye. That's, that's my thought process there. <laughs> I think that's what I was I was thinking. It's just like I really kind of like I I'm sure Ewan is a player, but I also feel like we just have a really good time. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> so and anybody who's that willing to be naked on screen. It's just like whatever, you know. <laughs> right. I had a, I had a friend in graduate school who called him you and McPecker because it was like it was <laughs> always frontal nudity in like whatever film he was doing in the nineties. That's excellent. Okay, are we ready for our last one? This one I feel like is just an interesting combo of people. So I oh no, this is not the last one. Never mind. We have Gerard Butler. We have the late uh, Sean Connery. And Richard Madden, I felt like young Sean Connery was like an interesting wrench in all of this. Right. Um, I live in this little tiny tourist town in California. And uh, one time um, Jared Butler actually walked through the bookstore and I was sitting there in the cafe and literally everyone was like, and it's like, we get a lot of yeah. celebrities because we're close to Los Angeles, but it's like, you know, the sheer magnetism of this oh, yeah. dude in his t-shirt and expensive sunglasses. <laughs> it was, um, it was kind of ridiculous. So yeah. I would start, I would, I would uh, fuck Jared. I would marry uh, Richard. And um, after I've heard some comments of, made by the late Sir Sean, he's out of here. I'm uh, like, as a per like aesthetically, yes, as a person, I'm not so wild about him. Yes. I think that's, that's my answer set as well. Yeah. I think that would be me too. Fuck Gerard and mm. marry Richard, because honestly, the way Richard Madden says mom, 
yeah. in the series Bodyguard. Bodyguard. It's like, I mean, that's full play in itself. <laughs> so I feel like, you know, definitely him. And then unfortunately, I mean, Sir Sean, while his accent is so glorious that you could hear him read the phone book, I'm afraid he has to die. Yeah. Well, I like watching Bodyguard. He was also part inspiration for uh, uh, Duncan in this because, like, he is a soldier. So saying, "Mom," and you're just like, "Okay," (laughs) (laughs) you know. And Keely Haas was older than him, and I'm just like, I'm on board for all of that. So, okay, I clearly need to watch the Bodyguard. (laughs) Yeah. Okay, and then our last round. This one is the. The interesting combo of people. This is Tilda oh. Swinton, Gordon Ramsay, and Alan Cummings. Is that Tilda Swinton? Yeah. She's is she as Bowie, but is she great. Scottish? Or is it just like you just was, throwing her in there? <laughs> she was born in Scotland, so it counted. Ah. <laughs> there weren't as many Scottish actresses that were felt like were recognizable. Right. Um I'd say fuck Tilda, Mary Allen, and kill Gordon. Even though Gordon might be nice to have around for cooking, but I already I have my my husband Nico cooks all the time, so you can actually be a cook and not be an asshole. <laughs> I think I would agree with Ava there. Yeah, fuck Tilda, Mary Allen, and unfortunately, sorry, Gordon. You're going to that great kitchen in the sky. <laughs> <laughs> I think you would have a really good time with Alan. I think he would just be a lot of fun to have around on a consistent basis. So he would just be like a, a, um, but not in an irritating way. Yes, he does seem like he would be. Yeah, I like those rankings. I have a big soft spot for Gordon Ramsay on like the kids shows that he does when he's like actually a softy. Very lovely to children. (laughs) Yes, but only to children. So if we only have a few minutes left, we're running past the hour. Um, If anyone has any questions um, who's watching in the comments, um, I can pull them up on screen. So as we talk, it'd be, as we wait for comments and questions to come in, um, what are you guys working on next before um, or after the Duke uh, rake, I'd like to ask. I'm gonna keep saying Duke for a while. Um, I think, yeah, at the moment I'm working on the rake, I'd like to even story, Minaj. So, um, yeah, that's kind of all I'm thinking about right now. And after that, I'm going to have a bit of a holiday and, um, yeah, nice. then think about what I'd like to do next. Awesome. I just finished my um, Rilf story and um, I need to revi- like do a- revise it, but... Um, uh, that was a lot of fun because that was my first. I've never written a, a menage before, so that was all. That was super fun. And then after that, I'm going to write my second book in the Last Chance Scoundrels series for Avon, which um, uh, and I'm very excited for this one because I've already earmarked Tom Ellis as my hero inspiration. So um, nice. everything else doesn't really matter. Plot, whatever, <laughs> blah blah blah. That's done. <laughs> Who cares? <laughs> right. Oh, that's amazing. Okay, we do have some questions in the comments. I'll bring them on screen. From Ellie, what books are you loving right now? Um, I'm literally reading, this is um, oh. Tessa Bailey's It Happened One Summer, which is her kind of like Alexis Rose Schitt's Creek fan fiction. Um, and like I uh, just before this started, I actually got to a really spicy scene, and I'm like, <laughs> <"That's not." laughs> um, but I, I also just read um, "Act Your Age," Eve Brown, and I really enjoyed that oh, a lot. So good! I read yeah. that whole series for the first time this year, and mm-hmm. it just like every book was just like blowing my mind over and over yeah. again. So good. Um. I'm having a complete mind blank over books. Like, what is books? <laughs> what are books? <laughs> oh, always when someone asks. <laughs> what am I reading? What am I watching? I don't even know. I can't remember. Right. You can let us know if you remember. <laughs> um, we do have a comment of someone wanting to know if you had ever, either of you had ever been to Scotland. Yes. 
Uh, I did. I was there briefly for a few days um, back in the 90s. Um, but as a matter of fact, when we were talking about road trips, um, my husband and I have been talking for a while and we really would like to do one of those end to end um, trekking trips in Scotland. So um, at some point that is earmarked for a future uh, trip because I think we both would really, really like to do that. That's very cool. Yeah. I haven't. I was actually in the process of planning a trip to the UK um, in, when was it, 2019? And then oh. COVID hit. So unfortunately that's kind of on pause until, um, yeah, until yeah. we can wipe the world free of plague and um please get vaccinated everybody yes. so nicola yes. can go to scotland <laughs> yes yes damn it somebody everyone needs to think of my traveling because <laughs> it's, it's very difficult to get from new zealand to anywhere so yeah. um please get vaccinated yes um, and then we have a question specifically for ava um are we going to see a Rowan curtis book um, so I made an executive decision fairly early on when I was uh, working on the Union of the Rakes. I knew I wanted a same-sex relationship amongst two members of the Union of the Rakes, but I myself do not identify as LGBTQIA. And I felt that for me to write point of view characters who I did identify um, as queer, um, it just sort of like, it didn't feel like it was my story to tell. So I wanted to make sure that um, if I wasn't going to give them their own story, I was going to give them their happily ever after that didn't necessarily have you know, that helped like um, it complemented the um, the heterosexual mm -hmm. couple, but it also existed on its own and they had their own obstacles to overcome that is relationship obstacles and it's not mm -hmm. about suffering and it's not about misery it's about happiness and joy and so i wanted to ensure that when we saw them on the page um and they got their happily ever after that there was you know this sense of hope and joy and happiness um so um, I'm toying with the idea of doing like a Union of the Rakes holiday special um, as either like a newsletter giveaway or I might work with my publisher on that, but um, it would be just like a short. Um, so you'll see them again and they actually have a cameo in my next book called uh, The Good Girl's Guide to Rakes. Um, so you get to see that they're still living there happily ever after. So no, there won't be an, a separate book just for them. That was just a choice that I decided to make. Um, so, uh, that, and, um, I hope that that's okay. That's kind of where I've uh, decided yeah. to kind of position myself. Yeah. I love that answer. Thank you. Trying to get rid of it. Okay. There we go. No, no. Sometimes technology is terrible. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think that's all the questions that we have. Thank you guys so much for being here with us today. It was so fun talking to both of you. Well, thank you so much for having uh, having me and uh, for picking um, uh, Waiting for a Scott Like You as part of your hot Highlander summer. I, there it is um, with all of its, you know, 80s colors. Um, <laughs> and, <laughs> yeah, Trying and with the technology. <laughs> so thank you guys for having us. And I really want to thank everyone for joining us this, this evening and asking yes. questions and, and uh, listening to me be inappropriate. So thanks. No, oh, yes. Yes. Thank you to everyone who came to join us tonight. Um, if you're joining us and you're not familiar with Seasonally Booked Up, there should be a link to our Discord in um, the comment section below. We're going to continue reading Scottish historicals uh, for a few more weeks this summer um, and diving into them. And if you have not read these fabulous books, then please, please do yourself a favor and get them on your TBR ASAP. Um, so again, that was Waiting for a Scott Like You, Scandalous Passions, and then Wicked Passions in <laughs> wild colors right now. But. All right. Yes. Um, thank you so much, uh, Nicole and Ava. If you could both just stay on after, uh, we'll end the stream. And then to everyone in the audience, go enjoy your Friday nights. Go read some romance. Get vaccinated. Uh, stay safe, everyone. Bye. Bye. <laughs>